My name is Wilbert Ziegler, Wilbert L. Ziegler, but everyone in the parish probably knows me as Will Ziegler. I joined the parish in 1959 when my wife and I, uh, deceased wife Helen, uh, moved into the parish after we were shortly married. We moved into the Alma Apartments, which is up the street a bit, and uh, at that time joined the parish. My experience with Blessed Sacrament up to that point, as I remember, since I was a member of St. Agnes Parish prior to um, moving into this area, I uh, began school in 1939 there, and in 1940, Mary Ann Ho, who was one of our second grade classmates, her name is now Ellis, and I believe she's a member of the parish, she moved out to Blessed Sacrament School. And I can recall thinking, my heavens, that was as though she went across the ocean. It was just deemed to be so far out of the way. And of course, um, that's something that one remembers in a few later years through college and particularly high school, a number of us dated girls from Blessed Sacrament uh, or who attended Blessed Sacrament. We'd ride the bus or streetcar out here, walk down the street, get back on the bus or streetcar, and that was our date. But uh, at that time, Catholics only dated Catholics as far as we were concerned at least. Monsignor Leo Streck was the pastor when I joined the church and in fact, as a practical matter, he was the pastor all the while I was really active. The uh, first thing that I could remember doing uh, was when there was a Father Paul Nearman here. It's when we instituted the lector. Before that time, there were no lectors. This followed uh, the Vatican. And uh, so since he was a classmate of mine in high school and knew me from there, he asked me to be a lector, and I was a lector for many years here at Blessed Sacrament. Uh, I ceased that to give other people an opportunity because at that time, many people wanted to be lectors. Years later, there was a shortage of lectors, and I once again volunteered and for a number of years was a lector. The thing I remember most being active in, I was on the first school board. I was here at a time when the Catholic schools were organizing school boards. Up to that point, there were no school boards in Catholic schools. So I was on the school board and I was asked by Monsignor Streck to be president or chairman, I don't remember, of the school board. And so that was the first school board. We did things like look at budgets and talk about other matters, but to be truthful, I can't remember exactly what they were. But it was an interesting time there was something else that occurred at about the same time. The Diocese of Covington decided that the uh, first graders who otherwise would come to Blessed Sacrament should go to the public school as a way of, I guess, impressing on the public school officials that the Catholic schools were really taking a load off of the public uh, finances. So I sent my one of my sons to Beechwood and he did well and the next one followed it two years later so I kept him there too and they went through Beechwood we didn't bring them back to Blessed Sacrament. And I can always remember being president of the Blessed Sacrament school board with my two sons down at Beechwood. That was a little hard to explain but um, that's the best explanation that I could do. Uh, over the years, I have uh, not been really active in other organizations of the church. My wife and I were members here. She died in 2014, and the uh, funeral was held here. In fact, I sat right there in that front bench by myself at the time of her funeral service. Since that time, uh, I've remarried, and we don't live in Blessed Sacrament Parish anymore, but. I still maintain my membership here, but I am not a regular attender because her church is elsewhere. So that's about the extent of my story that I can remember offhand. My name is Lois Seisiger, and I have been a member of Blessed Sacrament Parish and my family all the way back to the days of Father Blease and the days when the church was first built. Uh, I believe it was dedicated in 1939, and I was only six months old then, 
but I have the distinction or the honor to say that my father was the general contractor on the building of the church. And he was very close associate of Father Blees, admired him, respected him, uh, and worked well with him, as did many parishioners, uh, all the while that Father Blees was the pastor, or at least from the mid-30s, 1930s. And um, I uh, remember every pastor we've had personally. And uh, when Daddy was building the church, now I was just an infant, but I've heard this story many times in the family from my sister who has passed two years ago, that Daddy would check the jobs in the evening as he did on many of his projects. He was the general contractor and he would take Patty along to kind of give mother a little relief and time to take care of the baby, me. And he uh, gave her the nickname of Tom because he had only girls then. And uh, so he and Tom would go check the uh, church, the, the, what, what it had been done, what it needed to be done. And it was a very, uh, very vivid memory to her. Also, the brick, the brick company that did the brickwork on this church was Taylor and Hayes. And the, the local architect who is now deceased, who has done much church, church and school work in Northern Kentucky, Robert Emmett Hayes, he has a memory the same way of going with his daddy to check the job. And he told me one Sunday, talking outside of Mass, um, that he liked coming to church here for Mass once in a while because he could just almost like feel his daddy's presence in that memory of when the church was built. Um, when Father Blees retired, he went to a home on record that I believe the parish arranged for him. That was in 1947, 48, and by then I was nine years old. So I do really remember coming to Mass, putting our little envelopes in the little slot by the door. And um, Daddy then would go get him in the mornings and bring him here to church. And Father Blee said his mass by himself with my, my brother Joe serving at the St. Joseph altar. And that was many, many times a week that Daddy did that. And uh, uh, it kind of showed how close they were, you know, that he would do that for him. And something else that uh, I think maybe I could contribute um, I looked at the, one of the booklets that was put out in 2000 about our parish, and it lists the general contractor, brick, all those people. And there's a name on there that is connected to our beautiful nativity set that we have at Christmas time, our figures. That's uh, A.L. Hager. Mr. Hager had the nickname of Dolly because his first name was Adolf. You can see why they looked for a nickname. And he... <coughs> and his wife had traveled to the Gaspé Peninsula in the province of Quebec in Canada. And there were along that peninsula many artists and artisans and craftsmen who did wood carving and who did make these, these figures with the wax faces that we have. They're so, they're so realistic, life size. And he started, Mr. Hager did, bringing back figures like that and having a nativity set in his own backyard at Christmas time, which was in Lakeside Park. And it became a local uh, uh, thing to see at Christmas time, just like we might drive around for big light, lighting ranges. And uh, <clears throat> there was, it would actually cause a traffic jam on the Dixie Highway at Hudson Avenue. And the president of Western and Southern insurance company was traveling from the airport with his driver in question. What's this traffic? What's holding us up? And he wanted to see it. And he came and saw that. And that was the origin of Western and Southern sponsoring the crib that was in Lytle Park for years. And to this day is still at Eden Park. And Mr. Hager's mentor and the man who took over his business, Andy Biedenhorn, the Biedenhorn family still does that crib at the nativity in Christmas time at Eden Park. And, but it's the same kind of figures, the same thing that Mr. Hager and his wife uh, purchased for their own self in the beginning, but I'm sure they got the ones for the church here. And uh, in the 50 or 40s, late 40s, we had block rosary group as so many people do. And the Hagers were in our family's block rosary group. And, if, and I was in grade school then, and if we were really good and quiet and prayed well, and when we had it at Hager's, Mrs. Hager would take us to this solarium that they had the temperature 
controlled and, and get to see those figures that would appear at Christmas in our church and in Lytle Park. So it's a kind of a memory I cherish. And uh, I, I remember when Father Streck came, it was such a change because all we knew was Father Blees, but he was welcomed wonderfully. He, he was here while my brother was young and through school, he was here for a long time. And Father Grosser was the pastor when my own children were coming through the grade school. And then Father Quill and Father Rushman and Father Vogelpohl and now Father Hills. So <clears throat> I think those are some of my uh, um, best memories. I feel always have felt, and my whole family does, this affinity to our church because our daddy was such a part of it when it started out. And many other people too. I don't mean to shortchange anybody else who was involved in it. So. Okay, hi. My name is Julia Gieske, but everybody calls me Judy. Don't ask me why, I don't know. But um, my husband was a member of this parish since 1937. He was born in 1937. Uh, we got married in 1959, and we got married at St. Anthony Church in Bellevue, uh, to which I had belonged all my life up to that point. So as soon as we got married, we moved to Fort Mitchell on Greenbrier Avenue, and we came up and joined the parish. And there's a funny story concerning that. Father Streck was the pastor, and he was such a kindly gentleman. And I was expecting my first child, and we knocked on the door, of the rectory and he invited us in and we went to his office and sat down and he said ah what do you need and we said we would like to join the parish and he says oh he thought we were expecting out of wedlock <laughs> and he was very embarrassed by his little faux pas but it was kind of funny um, we joined here in 1959, September, and we moved into the home where we live now in February of 1960. We had our first child in July of 1960 and subsequently had 14 children. I joined the choir immediately because I had sung with Mr. Higdon, who was the choir director at that time, and he had taught me in college, so I thought, this is a good thing to be doing. So I sang um, with the women's choir. There were two choirs. There was a men's choir and a women's choir. We would join on big feast days, such as Easter and Christmas, but normally we sang separately. I remember bringing my oldest son to the choir loft with me during Mass, and that's when we had the old Mass with the bells and the smells. And at the consecration, when the bells were ringing, my son very loudly said, Mommy, answer the phone. And I thought, okay. But it was just a funny moment, and it just goes to show the perception of children and what they're getting out of what we're presenting. But my philosophy was present them anyway, expose them to their faith immediately, and they will grow up with that faith. And no matter how hard the times get, they will have that to fall back on. My faith is a huge part of my life. It was a huge part of my having children, my raising children, and I gladly sent them to Blessed Sacrament School because I didn't care if they were the smartest people on earth, but I wanted them to be the most well-adjusted people. And without faith, I don't think we can be well-adjusted. Blessed Sacrament has been such an integral part of my life, all my life. I've had all of my children baptized here. 
All of my girls were married here. Uh, I can't even imagine life without Blessed Sacrament. And my fondest memory, especially during the uh, 70s, 80s, 90s, was that I could walk in the doors and then I could see Christ up in the tabernacle. And that was such a comfort to me to know that he was there for me any time I wanted. I've raised all my children here, uh, many of them, even though they live in other cities like Hebron Union, Burlington, they come here on Sundays because this is home. I've gone through Father Streck, Father Grocer, Father Quill, um, Father Vogelpohl, oh, Father Rushman, Father Vogelpohl, and now Father Hills. And I loved them all. I thought they were all dedicated men, and I thought that their whole aim was to bring us closer to Christ. Many years ago, there were many uh, assistant priests up here because we didn't have a vocation shortage. Now there's only one, but he gives us all for our church, and I'm so grateful. I'm grateful to be a member of Blessed Sacrament, and I can't imagine myself anyplace else. My name is Mary Kay Anakin Laird, and I joined the parish in 1978. Um, we moved here and I was in fifth grade. I started fifth grade at Blessed Sacrament School. And I was confirmed and married here. And all my children were baptized here and confirmed and had their first communion here. And this is our son. What's your name? Miles Leo. And Miles was born in 1998. He was baptized here. He went through um, the Parish School of Religion, PSR, for nine years, and um, he still, we're still active parishioners today. Um, some of the unique things that we experienced as parishioners here, and Miles can talk about this too, is that when he was in seventh grade, who came up to you to tell you, to ask you to be a server? Um, it's a Dan. Deacon. Deacon. Jim. Dan. Mm -hmm. Jim Bain came up to Miles and said, would you like to be a server? And he was very excited about that. And so then we met with Deacon Jim and he trained him um, on the weekends and we got through and then he was able to be a server for mass. And he did that through, I would say, till he was about 16. And then what happened? You said you didn't want to do it anymore? Mm -mm. But then what you get to do? I pass the money. You, get, you collect the money. Yeah. yeah. And that was because Gary Massey came up to him at Mass and asked him to help out with that. So now Gary Massey and Larry McGovern, who's a lifelong parishioner, and Bradley Paul, every Sunday at 11 o'clock Mass, they look for him to help be a, um, an usher and collect the money. And there were some other times when he was in school here throughout his, um, for parish school religion, PSR, there were many students that helped him out in the classroom. Um, uh, Claire Brunson was one of them and uh, Ben Hepler to name a few but they were really good to make sure that he was involved in the parish and that he was um, able to participate in the Sunday school classes and receive all the sacraments. Is there anything else you want to say? Mm -mm. So we still come up every Sunday at 11 and, um, what we can. If we don't, he's worried that he's going to miss out on um, helping with the collection. But we try to come up to this church on Sundays at 11, and uh, we're still involved. And I'm on the finance committee now, and I've been involved in other committees um, throughout the years. And I think it's a wonderful parish, and I'm really glad to be a part of it. It's like my second family. My name is Johanna Stegman. I. Uh, my maiden name was Johanna von Handorf Stegman, and I've been a member of Blessed Sacrament Church since I was oh, about three, four years old. 
Um, I was born in uh, 1935, and my parents moved here in 1938. And uh, after we moved here, I remember going to Mass in the auditorium of the school because the church was being built. It wasn't built yet. And uh, that was really interesting. Actually, we were one of the first, and when I went to, to school here, to Blessed Sacrament School, and I went all my eight years here to school, but the first uh, grace grade was uh, already, uh, well, that, that of course had been built. The first grade was Sister Loyola, and uh, she was uh, just an, well known as a strict disciplinarian, and she took care of those first graders, I can remember, but she was a, a loving, wonderful person, but you know to toe the line right away. <laughs> and. Um, uh, but Mass was held in the school auditorium, as I said. I remember that vaguely, vaguely. Um, I, uh, Father Blease came in to visit that first grade, and I remember he had a broken, um, what do you call it, a broken uh, way of speaking, he, a very big German accent. But we could understand it, and, and it was just very jolly and, and interesting. Um, in the second grade, I had a teacher by the name of uh, Sister Bernice. She was a Benedictine. Both were, the, all of the nuns were Benedictines from St. Walberg out at Villa Madonna. And uh, uh, she was one of my favorite teachers. She taught us our first confession and first communion, you know, what to do. And um, um, she, uh, I remember we, are, we had to fast then from uh, midnight on, just like everybody else, so that the, the, the nuns all covered the drinking fountains with paper bags so we wouldn't forget and not be able to receive our First Communion. That was pretty interesting. Um, and, uh, they, let's see, in the third grade, I had a, a Sister Viola, uh, she remember, I remember Father Bleas uh, phoning my dad during this time and said my dad's first name was Herman. He was Herman von Handorf, pretty burnt German, huh? So Father Bleas knew that and knew that he, his parents had been German and that he could speak his language. So he would call on the phone and he would say, Herman, will you take me for a ride? <laughs> he loved to go for rides and, and uh, so my dad ended up taking Father Bleece many a ride in, the, in his days that he was here. So, God bless his soul. Anyway, and then the third day, third grade, I had Sister Viola. And she was just, uh, I remember Father, uh, let's see. Oh, I, I said that. Okay, in the fourth grade, uh, I had Sister Jonita. And she was the sacristan for the church. And so lots of times she was busy over here and we just got to get along really well by ourselves over in school. In the fifth grade, Sister Lawrence, she was a, a Benedictine, as I said, and she told us stories about the Second World War because her brother was in it. And uh, that was very interesting, I remember. In the sixth grade, Sister Francesca, she was a strict disciplinarian also, but very, ple uh, very pleasing and very kind. Uh, and in the eighth, the seventh grade, we made our solemn communion, which is something that we don't do anymore. But and I don't remember just when that discontinued that uh, practice. But it, it was a, it was really good because in the seventh grade you knew more about what Holy Communion and the Eucharist is. And maybe in the second grade, you were a little hazy about that, you know. But that, I liked having the Solemn Communion for that reason. And then in the, I graduated in 1949, uh, and he went to Notre Dame Academy uh, for four years. It was on uh, Fifth Street in Covington at that time. I did not want to go to Villa Madonna because it was out way before, and I wanted to be downtown where the action was. <laughs> So I got married uh, in here and, and on May the 21st in 1955. So my husband and I will be married for 68 years this coming May, if God permits us to stay around that long. <clears throat> and um, I don't think, I, I, we had eight children and uh, 
one, two, three, four of our children were baptized here because we moved for about um, eight, nine years. We lived out on, in Mary Queen of Heaven while we were in a little starter home. But when I was expecting our, our sixth baby, we knew we had to <laughs> get, go to a new place so, or find a bigger house. So we did. We came back here and Luckily, we found a house that my uncle uh, Ted von Handorf had built on Cornell Avenue between Sunnymead and Superior. And we've been there now for 55 years, I think. But we've raised a wonderful family there, and uh, he had plenty of room for everybody. And I love being a member of Blessed Sacrament. It's the most beautiful church. Uh, your, your eyes are just drawn to the uh, beautiful sanctuary and the tabernacle and uh, I am disappointed that they don't uh, what do you call it put the uh, I have adoration with the um, monstrance back where it's supposed to be but I understand the people want it closer to them so they put it on the, the altar out front when I was all while I was in school the priest was at the altar uh, facing away from us. You know, that's before the little altar was built. That didn't come until, oh my gosh, I guess it was around 19, uh, let's see, uh, we moved back here in 66. So that was about the time that they changed the altar, made it in the, in the front with the priest facing everybody. But I'm pleased to tell you everything I know about uh, Blessed Sacrament. Um, I love living here. I love lo love the the um, church, it's, it's my home. It's my home for my faith. Thank you. My name is Sam and the last name is Drogens. And I'm from Fort Mitchell, of course, born in Covington. Lived right across the street for most of my life. And when I started coming to church, I was very small, probably before I really remember. But when I do remember, you know, I was still very small, and this church was really big when I was really small. <laughs> so what well, didn't happen often, but once in a while I would get go to the bathroom, I guess, or do something. And when I came back into church, it's like, oh my gosh, where am I going? <laughs> you know, where's my dad? <laughs> but anyway, I grew up here. I went to Blessed Sacrament grade school for six years, and then I went to Latin school. But always, Blessed Sacrament was my home church, and one of the if not the biggest influence in my life, one of the biggest influences. When I was here at Blessed Sacrament, there were just great people here. The, the priests, God bless them all. I, I, I miss them. They were just wonderful. Father Streck was still here when I was a little boy. And he was absolutely, and I think still is, revered by parishioners here. But, you know, I didn't have too much interaction with the priests. Uh, obviously, every Sunday. But where most of my interaction took place was at the grade school. And some of the best people I ever met in my life, some of the greatest influences in my life, were a couple of the nuns there, Sister Aurelia and Sister Martina. Sister Aurelia I had for fourth grade. And I do remember first or second day of first grade, I looked at her and I thought, she looks mighty young to be a nun because most of them were old, fat. You know, this lady was slender and younger, probably still over 40 something, but to me younger. And I thought, mm, this is okay, but I'm not gonna learn much in here because she looks like an intellectual lightweight. Oh, was I wrong. That lady had more intelligence and a better teaching manner than I think I've really ever had anywhere else. I still remember she put us through diagramming sentences, which at the time I thought was stupid, but oh my gosh, you know, as I went on and lived life, I realized how valuable that was. Even though I don't still diagram sentences, I now understand the English language and can write the English language and can speak the English language much better than I ever could if, if I didn't do that. So for that, I thank her and God rest her soul. And I hope God welcomed her into his army of angels. She was delightful. And Sister Martina had for fifth and sixth grade. She likewise was younger. 
And she was just a great teacher. There was nothing out of the ordinary, just that she was a, a great teacher. She understood students. She understood our, our limitations, but she pushed, them, pushed us beyond our limitations. And I actually saw her about 10 or 15 years ago over at Bob Evans in Crescent Springs. And my mind doesn't play tricks on me very often. It had been 25 years since I seen her and she looked like she did not age one day. Maybe a couple more gray hairs, but other than that, she looked exactly the same as she did when I had her in sixth, fifth and sixth grade here. She's delightful, she, she absolutely is. All, but all the nuns, nuns were to me. I was around from the time I was a boy and I you know, always maintained my uh, coming to church here, always. I, it's my favorite church and I feel more comfortable here than any other church. Love going to, love to travel, been to thousands of churches probably in this country and many more. And always when I do, I think of this church. So, uh, hi, uh, my, my name is Mor Morgan Moore. Um, I, I go to Blessed Sacrament now and uh, as that, when I live with my wife uh, in Crestview Hills. We uh, are both natives of the parish and go way back. Um, she act, my wife actually pre, um, was an earlier member than I, uh, but I, uh, I moved with my family. I was uh, 11 years old. World War II was just the beginning to come to an end. And, and uh, that spring, uh, we moved to Blessed Sacrament Parish. We lived in, in Covington at St. Mary's Parish prior to that. And um, we moved to Lakeside Park, which is out the highway. And we were delighted to be here, and uh, we belonged to uh, the cathedral, which was a massive, beautiful church that we were very proud of and, and liked very much, because I was pretty young. But when we came here and I saw this church, I thought, wow, this is absolutely a beautiful place. And it was well set, sat on the street, and uh, street uh, uh, level was great. And we walked inside, it was simple, Had uh, we had everything, it was just painted one color yellowish. And uh, Father Belize was pastor. And um, some of the things we noticed, it wasn't as massive as the cathedral, but it was big enough. And instead of taking up collections at that time, there were deposit boxes at every door. And uh, we would put our offering of the weekly in the door. And that worked very well for Father Belize. And I don't know, it changed later, but that was just the first things I, I first noticed. I also was, I was just happy to be out here. Uh, I was from a family, there were um, eight uh, li live children in our family, my father and my aunt, there, was, there were 10 of us. And we were, had been in the funeral business a couple of generations ago, and we had a, instead of a station wagon, we had a Pierce Arrow limousine, which was a, it, it, it sounds expensive, but it really wasn't. It, was, it had d jump seats and we filled that up and we pulled up, looked like we were gonna be impressive people, but kids just kept coming out. And it was when we came to Blessed Sacrament and pulled in. So we recall doing that, but um, I, I was uh, at Latin school at the time, so I didn't attend elementary school. I would have been in the seventh grade, but um, uh, my, my, uh, I was always proud to be here. I felt like this is a, a good place with great people. And, and as I grew here and, and, and spent time here, um, we weren't, since 1945 until now, we weren't all that time here, but most of it. Uh, we belonged at um, uh, Mary Queen of Heaven Church for about six years right after, both, both of us were married here. We were parishioners, we were both married here. Uh, let's see, I guess n neither of us was baptized here, but the confirmation was here and uh, uh, I suppose the end of things will be here too because we're still still parishioners now. But, but we love it here and always have. In the time that uh, we've been here, um, I, I've done various things of a uh, Eucharistic minister, been usher, um, belonged to various uh, organizations and committees. I'm now very active in St. Vincent de Paul, our conference here, Blessed Sacrament. But uh, on one occasion, only one I recall, I, uh, I, I was up in the, I, I gave some kind of announcement, or an announcement rather, at the, and used the pulpit. I had not been at the pulpit before, and uh, it's an, it can be an intimidating experience, but that wasn't the problem so much. But I, I recall when I was up there, 
and I looked around and I just spoke, you know, what I thought. And I said that some of the finest people I've ever met in my life are here today, right in this parish. And that's how I felt. And believe me, I, I feel that way today. So I want everybody to understand that. Just, just my kind of people, and I feel at home here. So I, I hope that, <laughs> that they return that. We'll, we'll, we'll learn about that later, I guess. But um, that's the biggest thing, having said that, um, kind of sums up our feelings here. And we, we will both, I'm sure, be buried here too. And uh, have, uh, a lot of our friends aren't with us anymore because we're older. But uh, my experience has been great. The church has been great here. Um, we didn't have mass problems during the 60s and things like that. Always kind of laid back people who made cautious decisions to change and things of that nature. And just my kind of people. And I'm, I'm just happy to, to be here and to have been here. We, uh, after my wife and I were married here, and of course we, to our wedding, we went to the same Blessed Virgin statue and, they, and we sang Ave Maria like everyone else does. It, uh, but uh, we had eight children, uh, seven boys and a girl, and, uh, and they all went to Blessed Sacrament. Um, it, uh, all finished the eighth grade except uh, one who went, and, and he didn't because he went to Latin school, which, which he finished down there. But um, so we, we were parents and, and, and friendly, and, and I, uh, I, I did teach school for a year, so I, I can't say we were, I wasn't active as a teacher here, but um, um, our, all our uh, kids, our children, they, they think the same of Blessed Sacrament. Unfortunately, I don't have any of them here. They're all in different parishes, but we have, they have very good feelings about our time here. So, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Henry Barzak. I've been a maintenance director here since 1988. I grew up in this parish as a child. Uh, my mom and dad came over here in 1935 from Poland and my father was named the director here by Father Leo Streck. Uh, and I was born in 1955. So, you know, I truly enjoy it here. And the memories are, you know, when we were kids growing up, we used to play baseball with my older brothers. I am uh, five of ten children and you know before the gymnasium was put on uh, we played baseball out and kickball and everything with my brothers and sisters uh, when the gymnasium was put on Father Streck always gave us uh, one day maybe a month that we could go in and play basketball you know so you know it's great it's, it's been wonderful here. The church was built in 1938. Uh, you know, I remember the time when my father spent a lot of time here. We had to wash all the walls. We, you know, as I spoke before, uh, we did take the globes out of the lights on a yearly basis and we cleaned all those. This archway in back of me was like a gold plated. Uh, it was before the angels were put on there. Uh, and it just, it was, it looked phenomenal. There's really not been a whole lot of changes besides painting to the church. Uh, we had a company come in here, not in my time, but my father's time. And uh, they painted the whole church. Oh yeah in the whole church to the dome. The dome is actually gold leaf. Within my time here, it's been washed. Uh, they had to scaffold it and it, they didn't repaint it. They washed it down and brought it back to that gold color again. But, you know, there, there's been a lot of things that have gone on here since I've been here. I've gone through two editions. Uh, the uh, Undercross was reno renovated and in two phases. Uh, the church was rewired probably maybe five years ago. 
under the direction of uh, Father Daniel Vogelpohl. He was a pastor here at that time. And uh, it's just, it, it's been a lot of fun growing up here in this area and, you know, working for my father since I was maybe 10 years old. And, you know, finally filling his uh, shoes after he retired. And I've been here like almost 32 years, so. Okay, my name is Tom Holliker, and I'm a lifelong uh, member of this parish. I was, I was uh, baptized here in the church. I was confirmed in the church, and I was married in the church, so there's only one thing left, and that's to be buried in the church, or thereabouts. Um, but my first uh, remembrance of Father Blease was when I was uh, three or four years old. My mother and I would go to the rectory because the housekeeper was a personal friend um, of my mother. And I was introduced to Father Blease and, and uh, of course I didn't really understand too much from, from the standpoint that he was uh, didn't have real good English, but I mean, at four years old, I had, didn't have much English myself. So, so it was uh, uh, just a nice, you know, hi, and, and that was about it. But as I got older, and I was a server up here, I actually served for him when he was retired, and I used to, he used to say mass at the St. Joseph altar. Uh, during the week, and I was one of the four or five servers that was assigned to have to to have the um, to serve for him when and you serve for the whole week and um, but I got to know him better and and uh, he was he was really good he 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 appreciated you being there he he knew it was a you know, you had the, also, uh, his masses were at the same time as the uh, regular mass. So there was a little bit of confusion and a lot of different noises, but we got through it. And he was always appreciative and always thanked me for, you know, being there and, and that. So it was a, a good experience. And, uh, but my, my first encounter with the the parish itself was a, as a student when I was a first grader. And um, that was, uh, I knew somewhat what to expect because I had an older sister and, you know, I could hear some of the things she talked about. So I kind of knew what, what it was going to be kind of like. And we went to mass every day. Um, um, and then we'd have a, a recess in the in the middle of the the morning because I think the teachers thought we couldn't sit still long enough to to go to lunchtime. So so we had a recess and then we had lunch. And one of the things that was kind of unique about about lunch period and and going outside was at twelve o'clock the bells rang and that was when the Angelus was said, and everybody stopped whatever they were doing. And that was a period of about a minute or a minute and a half of where you would pray a little, little bit or say the Angelus. Well, the underpass was something that he realized that the west side of the highway, when they rebuilt the highway, it was a two lane highway, they made it a four lane. And, and he was concerned about the kids getting to school. So he went to the transportation department and asked the trans transportation department if they could put a, a tunnel or uh, something to that effect underneath the highway so the kids didn't have to cross the highway to get to school. And they bought into that. And that, that's, that's how that all, transpired and 
you know, he was forward looking enough to see that this was going to be a problem. As the community grew, the traffic would grow, which meant there would be more of a problem for the kids and, and that. And uh, there's a tremendous amount of kids that, you know, every day they walk home from school, they're maybe a half a mile from school, but they, they walk underneath the, the highway and that's how they get to school. So Satoli, thanks for coming to our parish and for interviewing our parishioners and for helping us to uh, rediscover our rich history. Uh, this is a tremendous parish, over 100 years old, and um, I'm so happy the people who have come to you today are able to recollect uh, so many stories uh, of growing up here, of receiving their sacraments here, uh, of their ability to lead a life of grace through the assistance of this parish dedicated to our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, our parish started 100 years ago uh, in Fort Mitchell, but not here on this campus. This property hadn't been purchased yet. And so we started up the street, or down the street, I should say, at the orphanage run by the Sisters of Notre Dame. And so parishioners, well, Catholics in Fort Mitchell started meeting there on Sundays for Mass. Uh, with a priest from Germany named Father Blies. And uh, over time, he uh, was able to save up some money to buy the property here that we know as our campus. And he, uh, the first thing he did was build a school because it was so important to teach the faith to the children. And uh, in those days, according to uh, the Third Council of Baltimore, um, uh, the bishops of the United States got together and made a ruling that uh, pastors, uh, if a priest was a pastor of a parish in the United States, he had to have a school for his children. So it was imperative that we get the school going so that the faith would be handed on to the next generation. So he started the school first and Mass then was in the school. Um, we moved out of the orphanage and we had built the school and made Mass in the school. Then came, uh, we had to get sisters for the school, and so he had to build a convent for the sisters and a house for the priest. So then he built two more buildings, the convent and the rectory. And then the last building is the one we're sitting in. That came last, the church. And uh, so uh, you, you might have, driving on the campus, you might think this was the first building because it's the most important, but it, the order was, uh, uh, wasn't, wasn't that way. It didn't follow that direction. So they finally laid the cornerstone in 1938 here, even though um, I believe the school building was built around 1924. Uh, and so uh, uh, I've been told that the school children all wrote their names on a piece of paper. And when the uh, cornerstone was being laid, the paper was somehow inserted into the mortar or behind the cornerstone so that their names are sort of there at the foundation of the church. This is a nice story. There's no way to check it out, though, unless you take the stone out. But I, I, I've been told that story, and I, I, I'm inclined to believe it. Uh, and so anyway, uh, and so Father Blees built this church. I, I think it's remarkable how much he built in what we're trying uh, financial times in the United States. Uh, he was the pastor during the Great Depression. And yet somehow the people here following his lead were able to gather their resources and were willing to make tremendous sacrifices to build what is really a, a just a beautiful uh, almost majestic kind of parish church with these grand columns and arches and the beam ceiling stained glass windows and the marble altars etc so I, I think it's remarkable they did this in when a time when the it was very difficult to gather resources because the economy was was in a bad way. So that shows you the, uh, the great faith the people had in God and their love for Jesus Christ. I mean, that when you walk in and you realize what they accomplished, uh, we could ask ourselves, do we have this degree of faith now? Are we as committed as they were? And I'd like to say that I think our people are. Uh, but I'm also glad I don't have to build a church like this <laughs> because it would obviously be a lot of work. Uh, to gather the resources and uh, to sweat it all out. 
uh, day in and day out, wondering how you're going to pay for this and that and the other thing. So uh, uh, ever since then, people have been coming here since the church was dedicated. Uh, we finally, the church was consecrated in 1945. The uh, rule for churches was that you couldn't, a bishop would not come and consecrate the church unless the debt was paid off. So they laid the cornerstone in 38, and Malloy, Bishop Malloy came and uh, consecrated in 1945. Consecration means the bishop comes into the church and he actually anoints the, the walls of the church. He goes around and smears sacred chrism on the wall. And that's why on the walls of the church you'll see these individual crosses. There are 12 of them, uh, one cross for each apostle. And the bishop smeared the wall in 12 places uh, to signify that this is now set aside as sacred space, which means it can't be used for other things. Uh, it's a sacred place. It's consecrated. Um, um, there are a few things like that in the church. Bells are consecrated, for instance, as well. And um, in the old days, a bishop would consecrate chalices as well. Now that, 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 that blessing, that's just become a blessing. But it was in those days, the chalice was set aside only for the precious blood, never to be used for anything else. So um, there it was consecrated in 1945. And in the meantime, the school kept growing. Um, with more and more students. We ended up having nine sisters living in our convent. And they ran the school and uh, did a great job uh, teaching our children. And um, of course, after the war, there was a baby boom. So the enrollment got so big that eventually by 1960, in the 1960s, uh, we had no kindergarten and we had no first grade. The children had to go to Beechwood for their beginning year or two of schooling because we had no room. So school started here at second grade, believe it or not, in the, in the late 60s, that's how many students were in the building uh, in the daytime, um, it, which is remarkable. Um, and uh, so anyway, I, I was on the tail end of that uh, baby boom. And so when I went to school here, uh, we had no first grade. Uh, we were 110 in our class. Uh, and uh, we had sisters in every grade level and a sister running the school, Sister Antonella, principal. And the sisters were tremendous. They were great educators and I loved them dearly. Uh, I think they gave me, they helped form me in the faith, um, taught me, you know, religion and Bible history, and taught me how to write in cursive and uh, just tremendous teachers. Uh, they helped me to fall in love with the Blessed Mother and uh, with all the teachings of the faith. They were just remarkable. I have no sad stories about the nuns, no bad stories, no disciplined stories. No, I, I, I had a great experience with the sisters. Um, and uh, I'm glad for the experience. Uh, so uh, it was a good school and uh, uh, it really prepared us well for high school. And, just did a great job witnessing the faith to us. And um, so I was happy to be, a, to, to be baptized here and to grow up here and uh, to grow in my faith in this beautiful parish. We had tremendous priest as well who helped serve the uh, community. And um, my earliest recollection of a priest would be Monsignor Streck. He was the second pastor here. And uh, he was pastor when we made our, received our first Holy Communion. We were the last class to receive first Holy Communion from Monsignor Streck in May of 1971, and then he retired. I remember him as a kindly, gentle man. Um, and uh, my sister tells me a story that when she was young uh, and she was having a bad day at school, I don't know what happened or what was wrong. She was upset. And so um, they brought her to Monsignor Streck and he sat down with her and they had a dish of ice cream. And things got better. So he's this kindly man uh, and a gentle soul. And uh, uh, then he retired and then Monsignor Grosser came. And the parish was still very big and vibrant um, because it was the biggest parish in the diocese at that time. And so there were four priests in our rectory, four priests serving the parish. Um, 
and uh, uh, just a lot going on with, with that many parishioners uh, to be served. Uh, busy mass schedule. There were four masses on a Sunday morning. Um, and uh, and so Monsignor Grosso was, had been rector of the seminary, and he was just a great leader, uh, a, a, a sort of a natural kind of leader. He's just, and a great uh, history. He was ordained by Bishop Malloy and was immediately made Bishop Malloy's secretary and uh, was a Monsignor very early on in his priesthood and uh, was sent off to Canada, to Toronto, to study medieval philosophy. He's got his doctorate in, uh, at the Pontifical uh, Institute for Medieval Studies in Toronto, and came back and then ran the seminary, and then we, we, could not, we had, and he became our pastor. And he was here through, I think, the mid-'80s, uh, and then we switched over, and then there were other pastors to follow. Um, but I have fond memories of those priests who served us, and. Uh, and uh, just uh, nothing but good memories about Blessed Sacrament. It's just such a beautiful place. The, the campus is pretty, the church is gorgeous, but uh, most of all, it's the people uh, and their faith life. And these are good people here who are living the faith, practicing the faith. They love God and they love each other and they love people in the community. There's always been a tremendous outreach from this parish to serve others. And so the, the greatest beauty of the parish is obviously the people. And I think you can see that here. You spend some time here, you'll find that out.